applause even before we've begun. That's uh, probably a sign that I just need to quit while I'm ahead. Okay, well, thank you all for those of you who've stuck around. Last session, last day, you have made it. And we have a fantastic panel here for you today. We are going to be talking about the recommendations for the interdisciplinary approach to a uh, architecture for the first human mission to Mars. There is context for this. But before I get into that, I want to introduce our fabulous panelists who will be talking to us about architecture, systems engineering, and science. And I would first like to call to the stage Tim Sheehan. He is a space exploration architect at Lockheed Martin, where he leads a multidisciplinary team of engineers who figure out how to help astronauts and robots visit the moon, asteroids, and Mars, previously with the Orion System Architect, and joined Lockheed Martin in 2002 and has worked for both human, spaceflight, and commercial communications with satellite teams. So welcome, Tim. Next, I would like to bring to the stage Dr. Jen Rockless. Um, she has an incredible background. She spent her career bridging the sciences with human element and strives to bring that synergistic approach to her clients. She is president and CEO of Advancing Frontiers, a consulting company um, providing spaceflight integration services, a very long bio, including 20 years at NASA where she was a division chief in the Human Health and Performance Directorate and a branch chief in the Engineering Directorate and um, the Associate Director of the Human of Human Resources. So welcome, Jen. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Elia Overby, a professor of bioastronautics at the University of Austin, where she's building a student spaceflight program. Her lab focuses on correct characterizing molecular changes in the human body during spaceflight, and she's also co-founder of the Cornell Aerospace Medicine Biobank and Spaceomics and Medical Atlas, which collect, store, and analyze human health from astronauts. Last but not least, she is the Chief Scientific Officer at BioAstra, which leads the development of research projects to advance human health capabilities in spaceflight. So give it up for the panel. All right, so as we get to um, our discussion today, I wanted to contextualize who we have on stage and why. And so um, in December of 2023, Explore Mars hosted a workshop um, essentially solicit soliciting public input from science, human performance, the commercial sector, as to further inputs for defining the first human architecture to Mars. It was very well attended, 40 plus attendees. We have two of them on stage with us, uh, Dr. Overby and Dr. Rockless. And um, today we're gonna build upon key recommendations from that workshop. So there were four key recommendations across collaboration, systems engineering, and science. And briefly, the first recommendation was to create or support more frequent public interaction forums like that December, um, uh, public forum and the today is in fact us building on that and soliciting, soliciting your input. So get ready with your questions. The second recommendation was to acknowledge and address the balance that we need to strike between um, science and prioritizing science which mitigates risks to the human element of a Mars mission versus science for discovery. The third recommendation was um, to uh, continue to build an architecture that can evolve to keep up to accommodate new and emerging technologies. And lastly, the fourth recommendation was to encourage partnerships between commercial space and NASA to invest in technologies that would make use of the moon as a test bed looking towards Mars. So that's the context in which we're coming to you today. We're gonna to start off with an extension of that across mission architecture, systems engineering, and science. And each of our panelists is gonna take you through um, a few slides here. So Tim, kick us off. Thank you. So from an architecture perspective, um, the workshop had um, four major recommendations. Um, and the first is recognizing that uh, NASA's new process, the, um, of the Moon to Mars architecture process, um, it is important and Explore Mars and the community in general really supports that process. Um, and we're, we're pretty excited about that opportunity where I think NASA is communicating more and clearly about um, the work that they're doing towards Mars and the why. In particular, I, I really appreciate the short white papers that NASA's releasing. They've been, they've been excellent. Um, and I'm happy to have that out in the public. Um, 
The second recommendation is sort of to complement um, that process um, and to provide feedback to the process. Um, we're, we're recommending more feedback and more opportunities for engagement with NASA. So not, we don't want to replace the architecture process with the you know, explore Mars architecture process, but we want to um, enhance that so that NASA is getting diverse feedback from the community across mission and engineering and science to make sure that you know, the very difficult decisions that are up, um, upcoming in defining that Mars um, plan uh, are, are done with full community engagement. Um, and the, the ADD, the architecture definition document, is a great starting point um, to iterate, and that is the plan for the ADD, is to iterate through the years. They've already re released two updates in the last two years. They'll release an update each year. Um, and we want to make sure that the stakeholders um, are across industry, academia, U.S. government, international space agencies, international uh, companies and industry and academia, uh, all that. Um, and then during the workshop, we um, brought together that cross-section of stakeholders um, to, to provide a channel to enhance the cooperation and, and communication. Um, but one of the major recommendations is, is a more frequent interchange of ideas. So right now there's a, a singular public meeting um, every February. It's kind of like a small conference. Um, and there's large presentations and smaller workshops where NASA is getting our feedback. Um, and I think there's a website where you can submit comments. But I think that um, we need to create and support new and more frequently recurring public forums um, so that NASA, um, it's not just one day a year that's getting the input face-to-face um, -face in, in discussion, that it's, it's more frequent than that. Um, and, and I think that we should also highlight opportunities for public participation and really draw from um, the many communities. All, all the space architects who care about Mars are bothering NASA all the time, but it's the other, other things, um, other disciplines, particularly around science and research and medical, that, that we want to engage, and they may not be engaged uh, with NASA. And then um, another idea that came out of the workshop was to somehow certify groups as external e experts, and I'm sure Explore Mars is thinking of themselves, but there's all kinds of different groups. Um, and MEPAG, the Mars Exploration um, Analysis Group, um, would be another one where NASA knows that they're a trusted partner and have the expertise. Um, so some of the values here of, uh, of a diverse campaign, um, we want to make sure that uh, the architecture and the missions evolve as we learn new things um, and as we develop new technologies and as we practice them on the moon. We want to make sure that if we're going to be successful going to Mars, we, we really need to use, for the most part, today's technology. And today's technology is capable of supporting that, that journey. Um, we don't want to just focus on um, the first mission. It, we like Artemis at the moon, Artemis at Mars is intended to be sustainable. We will go to visit, to stay, to uh, do <laughs> a planet's worth of science. Um, common standards, requirements, and interfaces, always key. And then fle and flexibility, right? It's a sustainable program. It'll be many years. We need to be flexible. Um, and then as NASA has been doing, we want to maintain focus partner with commercial companies, partner with international partners. Um, we need to leverage the experience of the entire world if we're gonna to go to Mars. And we get to practice at the moon, which is an excellent opportunity um, to test out all, all of these things. All right. Okay, thank you. So I'm just gonna to touch on um, a brief aspect of some of the recommendations that you've heard already. Um, first, I want to talk about systems engineering and as it relates to specifically this recommendation, which speaks to a little bit about the risk trades between doing discovery science and discovery engineering and risk mitigation. Um, and typically, we tend to not like to fly things until they're fairly mature, so we're pretty confident about what we're going to get out of them from results and their competent technologies and mature 
But we also do that sometimes at the loss of discovery science or discovery engineering, where we might be able to learn a few things a little earlier in the systems engineering process to really burn down that risk in a different way. So we have a great set of processes to look at the risk to humans and performance, and we burn those down in research plans. But how can we really be a little more agile and flexible about doing engineering and discovery um, work earlier on to help inform the scientific objectives so um, that when the science team comes and tells us what our priorities are going to be, we can start to understand really in, in conversations directly with them how to start to begin to engineer and test those systems out so we understand what the art of the possible is. Um, maintaining, of course, the flexibility that you mentioned because we know that we're going to evolve those scientific endeavors over time and we don't know what we don't know. So we want to involve um, those folks and communities early and often so that we can continually iterate along these lines. Um, and so you'll see here quickly, I've just outlined um, the systems engineering requirements process. This is you know, standard, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. But what I wanted to point out was that typically um, we don't see human health and performance requirements until the system requirements review. And that's almost to phase B of a system requirements um, engineering flow. It's really late. Um, we really want to make sure that we're bringing those conversations far, far earlier. And this is really the premise of human systems integration, um, which is something I champion um, all, all day long. Um, and I do want to make the point that human systems integration is different than human-centered design. Human factors, human-centered design is an engineering discipline. Um, and human systems integration really is a management and technical process that works across the entire life cycle of the systems engineering process in order to minimize the cost and maximize performance. And to do that, we have to think about all of the humans across the entire life cycle, not just the users at the end, which is great that we care about them, but we also care about the designers and the maintainers and the logisticians and the folks who are doing the data analysis when it gets back, and there are costs in all of that. So when science objectives come on and we say we're going to gather all this data, there's a cost to analyzing that data, to storing that data, to housing it, um, the security of it. And we don't typically think about all of the humans that touch all the pieces of the system. And this is where we drive up costs. So just to show you what this looks like um, in graph form, this is an ENCOSI graph that we've put into our human systems integration handbook at NASA back when I was there. And I love this graph because it's pretty instructive. Um, first, I want you to notice that by the time we're at system requirements review, we've committed about 65 to 70% of our cost already in the program. We've locked it in because we've already written the requirements that says, here's what we're going to go do. And when you bring the conversations to that point, um, after that, the cost to make any changes, it says to extract defects here, but really it's any change that you want to make. So, oh, we didn't think about that. Let's do that. Or how about if we also could do this? So any of those changes now are going to cost you, you know, 10 to 100 to 1,000 times more the later on you do it in the process. So this really is a data-driven argument for saying, please bring us all in early, iterate often, continue these conversations directly with these teams, um, and bringing the science the engineering, the human system performance, and the architectures together. Um, we're thrilled that NASA is um, has adopting HSI in this way and looking at these sustainable costs, but this is really what it takes to build a program that you can sustain and you, that can grow with you. Um, so we were excited to be able to recommend some specific areas um, that they could engage us now. So let me pass it on. All right. Hi, everyone. One of the key things that we focused on during the workshop was what types of science we could do on Mars and how we would prioritize which types of science we want to do. Um, there's many different fields that focus on science that we would want to do on other planets that we've already done a little bit of on the space station that we want to do on the moon that we really want to do on Mars. So we're really interested in planetary geology and astrobiology and different types of atmospheric and geological sciences um, and on learning more about human biology and physiology. So when we're planning a mission, how do we start prioritizing which of these we can perform? Um, and there's also another consideration in here. We can do some things on Mars and some things we might have to take back to Earth. And how do we distinguish what's important to do there versus what we can do back here? And there were a few different ways we approached this problem. Um, but one answer that emerged was, you know, which scientific hypotheses that, you know, if we answer, will enable us to be more adaptive to Mars and to our new environment. 
um, in order for us to maximize our chances of success there. So for example, what can we learn about human health and performance that'll make people healthier and more resilient while they're on Mars? Um, what can we learn about the resources around us that will help us produce infrastructure such that we don't have to get all of our raw materials from Earth whenever we want to build something new? And also, how can we support entrepreneurship and in industry? Um, because if you want to stay on Mars in the long term, you, you don't want it to be a camping trip like the moon was, where it's been about 50 years since anyone's set foot on it. How do you make sure you're sustainable there? And the key option it would be to create a self-sustaining economy. So how can we make sure that what we're learning about us and about our environment can also produce economic opportunity? Thank you all for that excellent overview. Um, let's jump into questions. And so one question I actually have, this is directed to or it's you, Jen, um, because in the lead up towards this panel, this term of architecting from the right came up. And you, you kind of explained that in your, in your slides, but do you want to speak a little bit more as to what that term means and why it's novel when we th talk about architectures? Sure, so the architecting from the right is saying, if we outline the science objectives that we're trying to achieve, we can sort of back engineer, right, reverse engineer out of that. What are the functions and tasks that we need to perform to execute on those science objectives? And then once we understand what we need to do to achieve those, we say, all right, what do we need to provide the humans with to get them in physical, mental, um, and health-wise readiness to cognitively, you know, as well, um, readiness to perform the training, all those tasks. And then we also say, what are the systems that we need to engineer around that? So we are creating a set of requirements that have been driven by the science objectives that you're trying to do. So when you, they lay it out at NASA and they have the picture, they'll have the science objectives on the right, which is what they're explaining there is, let's get back to the requirement set from those um, outside objectives at the end. Perfect, thank you for that context. So I know you all are experts within your own um, areas from architecture to science to systems engineering. And I know you all have your own ideas of priorities that you wanna see when it comes to coming towards that close to a final product towards an architecture for Mars. So if you were hard pressed to name one, maybe two priorities um, from your own vantage point, what would you name as those two? Um, Tim, we'll start with you. So I think as we make the decisions about Mars architecture, there's some really fundamental things, perhaps in, a, in architecting from the right, that we need to define. And, and they're, they're, you know, how many people are going? Um, how long do they want to stay? Um, and that, from that, so much flows from, from those simple things. Um, and I'll t one example is, that how long do you want, we want to stay? We don't have the same flexibility that we do at the moon. Um, we can go and we can stay for about a month, um, and or we can go and we can stay on Mars for about a year, and that's the way the orbital mechanics work. And that is a very big decision. Certainly, if we stay less time, then um, there's less risk to the crew from radiation and things like that, but also, um, the probabilities of something going wrong are just, they're just less, whether it's appendicitis or uh, breaking a bone or some technical problem. Um, but it takes a lot more um, propulsion to, to have that shorter stay. Um, and therefore the vehicle um, has more technical risk in order to do that quicker propulsion. Um, and that's traded against being a year at Mars um, now the risk to the crew is higher and there's logistics needs for that year. But you're there on Mars for a year um, out of a three-year mission. And uh, there's a lot that you can get done on the surface in a year. And so that is probably the biggest choice um, that I think NASA needs to make here pretty soon in order to drive out um, what the architecture will be. So you're, you're viewing the, the priorities as balancing the technical risk versus the human risk and kind of jigsawing those together to fit together somehow. Yes, and it's been like that since we first sent humans into space, right? Um, and and, and you know, so choosing that level of risk is, is the biggest risk. Great. Um, Jen, do you have any thoughts on priorities from your vantage point? Um, my number one priority is to get everyone to redefine um, the word system. Um, I would like everyone to start thinking of the system as the hardware and the software and the human. 
Um, I think so often we think of the software and the hardware as the system that we give to a human to operate. And if we aren't thinking of the human as an integral part of the system from the get-go, um, we are already behind the curve. Um, and we're not typically designing what we think we're designing. I think we tend to get really wrapped around the axle about verification and checking boxes of requirements, but we don't often go to the validation part, which is really important because it says, did we actually build the thing we were intending to build? And when we don't include the human as part of the system inherently, um, oftentimes we can meet requirements, but we're not validating that we're intending on the, in, you know, the outcome. And just pulling on that thread a little bit, historically and from your vast experience, um, when we haven't thought as the human as part of the system, can you name some instances and in how that's hindered our planning for future architectures? Sure. I'll give you an example that most everybody was probably, it was probably familiar with, which is the space shuttle. Um, when the space shuttle was imagined, the idea for the flight rate for the shuttle was quite high. It was, you know, we could turn it around in two to three weeks and we would have many missions in a, in a year. Um, but they never actually included the human as a uh, system component when they were looking at the maintenance plans. So when they brought the shuttle back and they started to refurb it, um, it required many, many, many people to refurbish it. It required many specialized tools. They had scaffoldings. They had to almost pull the thing apart and redesign it with the avionics and the base. And so it wasn't designed for maintenance, for example. So again, and that's something that you would think is later in the lifetime of the shuttle, you know, after it returns, not in flight, which isn't the part that people were paying attention to. We didn't design it that way in the beginning. And our flight rate was incredibly low as a, as a result of that, because we just couldn't turn it around any faster. Right, and so, so just to pull on that one more time before we head over to Elia, um, what would have made that turnaround, like what, what modification would you have made to mm -hmm. make that turnaround um, less cumbersome? So what we would have done, and we're doing now, and I think NASA has really embraced since we've started to really implement HSI um, more strictly, is to bring the operators and the maintainers into the room with the engineers and the astronauts and the operators and the trainers earlier on and saying, hold on a second, from my experience, if you want to do this, this, and this, this is what we're going to need. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Okay, well, do we have a facility for that? And do we need this and that? And, you know, you'll see, I can give you many examples of where um, companies at an industry are starting to learn this lesson as well, where they list, when they let contracts out for bids, if they say they want to prioritize the human systems integration, um, companies will come back and say, hey, I might be able to get you a little lower performance and a little higher cost, but I can extend your maintenance you know, um, next, excuse me, make your maintenance super simple, you know, six tools and no hazmats and, you know, two people. And over the lifetime of that product, it's completely worth it to sacrifice a little performance and have a little more spend up front. So earlier, more often, it does cost money to do that. I'm not suggesting it doesn't, but it will pay dividends on the back end in sustainability. Right, so involving all actors who have a stake in the, in the Absolutely. mission. Absolutely, all the humans. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> um, so Elia, I know you have thoughts on this. What are your priorities from your vantage point for a mission to Mars? Yeah, so I think you are completely right. We have to consider humans as part of the system. Um, so when you get back from a mission, you can pull apart the, the rocketry, you can pull apart everything that comes back, but you're not gonna be pulling apart the humans. So we have to figure out some way of figuring, you know, determining what's going on in their body during the mission um, and when they come back such that we can better prepare for future crews. So things like taking regular blood samples or urine samples, looking at biomarkers and determining what's going on with their health. Are there any major events that might be upcoming based on what we can detect? Um, are we seeing a lot of bone and muscle loss? Do we need to start mitigating this? Um, so keeping, keeping those human elements in mind and thinking about it as part of the overall mission architecture is going to be really important. Um, the other thing that came up when all of the scientists were getting together, they all had very different images in their head of what the mission would look like that kind of took us a little bit to sift through. So some people thought it would be more of an orbital mission where they're in the capsule the whole time, orbiting Mars, never touching down on the surface. and that vastly changes the type of science you're able to do than if you're actually touching down and setting up a habitat. You could still do atmospheric science from orbit, but you're not going to get your hands on any rock samples. Um, you can do human health from either one. So depending on whether or not you're even touching down, if you're there for a month, if you're there for a year um, or longer, is going to vastly impact what type of science you're able to do. Perfect. And so 
Let's talk a little bit more about science. Now, we heard that one of the priorities coming out of the workshop was finding this balancing point between where we prioritize our science, both to mitigate risks to human health and performance versus discovery science, because this is a whole new environment. There's a lot of discovery to be had. Um, so we'll stay with you, Elia. How do we approach that? Do you have any thoughts? Um, so how do we approach all of the the finding the balance between discovery science versus mitigating human health. Oh, yeah, um, that's a hard balance to strike. Um, so I think one of the things people think about when they're thinking about Mars missions is they view it as either it's a robotic mission or it's a manned mission. Um, the ideal mission will probably be somewhat of a hybrid between those where you identify what the riskiest endeavors are that a human might need to do to execute their duties there, whether it's the scientific duties that they need to do, um, the architectural and structural duties, engineering duties, figure out what poses the greatest risk to the human's health and whatever that task is, um, and get a machine to do that instead. If you're doing some sort of risky exploration endeavor, is there you know, some type of rover or hover um, drone that could be used instead um, to navigate wherever you're going? So working together, um, robots and humans working together was a major consideration. Yeah, that's a great way of contextualizing it. Um, Jen, do you have anything to add to that or any thoughts on how we find the balance in scientific priorities? Um, first of all, I love robots, so I'm all for sending those as well. Um, I will say in a different um, way, I would love to see us take more data on the human and the environment um, as we are doing these space missions in a way that looks at the, I will say, the non-events. Um, so a lot of times we will find an event or a health issue or um, um, a science, you know, kind of piece of information, but we aren't taking the data up until then to see what was the environment, what was happening before, were the crew adjusting their own performance, um, their own, were they taking control of their own health before they sort of radioed down and said, there's an issue. Let's talk about, we're talking about mitigation and risk, for example. So let's say it, the crew waits four or five days before they would call for a health conference before something, you know, they would report. But they could have been doing things on their own um, in flight to try to mitigate their symptoms beforehand, for example. Um, we just lost four days of data, which gave us insights into what could have led to this event that was big enough to call down for help. Um, we also traditionally have not taken human factors data on errors that are made by the crew in orbit. And I understand because it's not popular to report down when you make mistakes, especially when you have crew that are wanting to fly over and over again. Um, but we're missing vast volumes of data on the systems that we're flying to understand if we're designing good systems, right? Because if people are making errors, that could be an error. Sure, it could be a human error, but it could also be one of the 800 humans that were involved in making that piece of equipment, right? The people who conceptualized it, who made the requirement, who engineered it, who qual tested it, who built it, right? There are a lot of humans that touch that. The person at the pointy end of the spear, the pilot, the operator usually gets the, the quote unquote blame for it. But there are a lot of places that we could look to to say, maybe we just didn't fly a really well designed piece of equipment for you. To so take blame, it, blame data. it on the ground crew is what you're saying. What's that blame on the ground? <laughs> the 400 some odd ground crew that get to help, right? <laughs> share the, share, share the, the, share the love, yeah. But, but I mean, there's a lot of data that we haven't been able to look at, and I think it's really informative data. And I would love to see us now that we're flying more people and more often. We have so few data points in space as it is. I'd love to see us really collaborate to get more information to burn down that risk in different ways. Great answer, great answer. Um, so Tim, do you have any thoughts on how we would strike a balance between managing and balancing different scientific priorities, particularly when it comes to human risk versus discovery science? Yeah, I think one thing that we do need to do is to have um, the scientists and the engineers planning the missions from the beginning and recognizing that it's gonna be a campaign. And so on the first mission, we'll, we'll take less risk with the crew to make sure that we understand how the total system, humans and um, vehicle are working, and then we'll uh, pack in more science with, with each mission. And, and that's what they did on Apollo. Um, there were science objectives right from the start, but it wasn't until Apollo 17 that they had a scientist astronaut there um, in, in the environment. I think we want to get to scientist astronauts immediately, but we will, um, a lot. I think we should, define those science objectives 
each mission increasing and increasing that, taking more and more risk because we've learned how the system performs. Great. And so before I get to my next question, I just want to invite the audience to submit your questions. Um, this is kind of your chance to add your voice to the forum and your thoughts for the architecture for the first human mission to Mars. Mars. So bring them in. And while we're waiting for your questions, um, I want to talk a little bit about technologies and what excites you about promising technologies for ensuring mission resilience, mission success, um, and then coming back to the recommendations from that December workshop. How might we use them? Um, how might we use the moon as a test bed for these technologies? Um, so, Jen, we're going to pick on you. <laughs> um, a, a lot of technologies are exciting right now. I think. I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can be a little bit more agile and inclusive in terms of, you know, we test a lot of times in analogs because that's what we can, that's what we can get. Um, I'm very excited that so many of the commercial companies are looking to incorporate into their mission um, science that even if it's a short-term mission, what can we still be learning? Because even though NASA has been flying for quite some time, um, the data set, like I said, is still limited. So I'm really looking forward to this technology explosion um, and especially the more data points we can gather on the human and performance, not just physical health, mental health, cognition, all of that, um, really the holistic view of the human is what I'm very excited about. Um, and there's a lot of technology development. We can talk all about autonomy and AI, and that's another huge area that I'm very passionate about. Um, and the collaboration between robotics and humans and AI and autonomy, um, there's a lot of modeling to be done with, um, with that, with human-human teams, and how we include them as, as team members and tools both. Um, and as that starts to get developed, I'm, I'm really looking forward to leaning into that discovery um, phase because this is an area, especially autonomy and AI, we need to be testing early and often and early and often and early and often. You have to shake out those systems. You can't just wait until it's ready and then fly it. Um, we need to see all the ways that we didn't expect it to behave and all of the ways that the humans interact with it that we didn't intend. Um, so that we can learn and do better. So as those are going to be hopefully helping us, um, and also in areas of big data, let's talk about you know all of the data we, we keep saying we want to capture, but who is going to do what with that data when it's done, and how are we going to make that data um, informative? And that's something where technology can you know, help us really advance rapidly, I think. Great examples. And I'll just note that when you say technology explosion, I choose to believe you're being metaphorical. <laughs> Yes, I hope so. <laughs> um, Tim, have any technologies that excite you about um, ensuring mission success on Mars? I'm very excited about nuclear power and propulsion. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is um, going to be kind of a big step in what we're capable of doing. Um, on the propulsion side, that will allow us to do these one month long missions um, because of the extra propulsion requirements. And on the power side, um, especially with um, the rover opportunity being lost during a, not just a dust storm, but a dust storm that was more severe than we ever expected. Um, when humans are on the surface of the moon, we're gonna be using nuclear power um, because of the dust issues. Um, and then we're working on programs right now to develop those systems, and we will test them out um, at the moon. So fission surface power on the surface of the moon really helps when you have uh, you know, the long lunar night and long shadows and eclipses um, due to terrain at the South Pole. Um, and then also from a propulsion perspective, um, as we are moving back and forth between the Earth and the Moon and, and uh, operating in cislunar space, the nuclear propulsion will allow us to more efficiently um, move throughout that space um, have lower propellant requirements, and then you combine that with refueling, and it's a much more sustainable way to be moving through the system. Yeah, that's a very neat example. Um, really, really great examples. Um, Elia, how about you? What technologies um, excite you for mission success on Mars? Yeah, I'm really excited about the potential for genetic engineering on Mars. Um, not just, I'm not thinking of humans to start out with, but if particularly plants. How can we get plants to grow better on Mars, grow potentially directly in the soil there or in the soil after some sort of processing? How can we engineer those plants to have better nutritional profiles or to potentially filter out anything that may be overrepresented in the soil that humans may not, may not be safe for humans to continue consuming over time? Um, I think there's going to be a lot of near-term opportunities in agriculture. 
and genetic engineering and CRISPR can help us a lot. All right, so while we've been chatting, so um, I love the CRISPR and gene synthesis example. Um, so there's uh, lots of audience questions that have suddenly rolled in, and I think we can get through them rapid fire. Um, and some of them are spicy, some of them are curious. Um, so because of the cost or complexity of a Mars mission, should we build up operations or go to a landing right off the bat? Um, using the citing the Apollo missions, for example, before a landing attempt. So should we do flybys, which, as everyone knows, Artemis II is doing? Should we do something similar for Mars? Um, thoughts? Who wants to start? I can start. Yeah, go for um, it. So we have a set of concepts called Mars Base Camp um, for human exploration of Mars. And we do start with one orbit-only mission. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One, the entry, descent, and landing technologies for Mars in the very thin atmosphere will take some time to develop. And uh, we don't think we need to wait um, for entry, descent, and landing before we do that first Mars mission. And then the, the orbit mission um, has a lot of value, um, both from testing out the human and the vehicle systems, um, but we can also perform science um, from orbit. Um, you know, we could actually do telerobotics at Mars um, if you're in orbit, um, but also we could visit the Mars moons Phobos and Deimos. Um, so we see a lot of value in a singular orbit mission, and then we can get onto landing. So I just got this vision of that creepy outsider scoping out the neighborhood, try not to be so overt. <laughs> um, does anyone else have anything to add? Go to the next one. All right, next question. This one's a medical one. I like it. Um, so um, what happens on a, well, humans are going to have to wear multiple hats at the same time on a Mars mission. How should this be addressed? How do we um, take that into account for medical emergency? I'm sorry, I missed the very first part of the question. On a Mars mission, um, humans are going to have to wear multiple hats. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that impact a medical emergency? Yeah, so you want, you want to make sure you have a bit of redundancy. So sending two people with medical experience might help mitigate some of those issues. I think we're also going to see in the very near future a lot of breakthroughs in AI where these LLMs are going to do a better job than some doctors perhaps at diagnosing various issues. So if you have a system like that that you can send, you can basically turn your entire crew into a medical staff if they know how to query it properly. Yeah, it's always awkward when you only send one physician and then they're taken out during a dust storm. So <laughs> yeah, no, redundancy will be the name of the game. So Two botanists on every crew. <laughs> yeah, two botanists. Exactly. Although I would want to add to that that I think we forget that we talk about time delay a lot when we go to Mars, but there are many, many moments on Mars where we just don't have communications at all, yeah. given the orbital mechanics and other things. Um, and that, I made a joke about it earlier, but the, the non-reliance on the 400 plus ground crew members who can help you solve a problem means that we have to design crew autonomy in from the beginning. So any medical emergency, even within redundancy, we have to assume that they're gonna to have to be able to handle it themselves. And that leads to the different outcomes of system designs than you would have if you assumed that they had help. I'm starting to get chest pains over here thinking about it. So thanks, <laughs> thanks for that. You're welcome. <laughs> so this one's getting a couple out upvotes. Um, what are the panel's thoughts on the unpopular one-way pioneering human missions, which would maximize science at increased speed? So any thoughts on a one-way mission? Um, Elia, we'll start with you. Um, I mean, I want to see us get there as soon as possible. So if we can pull that off without doing the orbital missions first, I think that's... Um, worth pursuing. The thing that's unclear to me is the, the technology gap between an orbital mission and what you would need for a longer term Mars mission. And I think if you want to have a permanent habitat too, there needs to be a path for independence from Earth. So how are you going to start getting all of your food? Um, how are you going to get the raw materials you need to maintain the space structure? Um, are we ready for people to give birth on Mars? Because that's the next natural step. So those are the sort of questions that come to mind that I think we just need clearer answers to. Great. Jen, any thoughts on a one-way mission? Hmm. Um, I'm sure there would be no shortage of volunteers, even if they knew it was going to be one way. That's what you were talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say that I think it brings to mind the reason for, exp the, you know, the reason to for exploration in the first place. You know, why are we going? And I think it's to, I hope it's to inspire, to expand, to explore, to evolve, to grow, to learn. 
Um, and that takes a certain level of risk and guts and courage and, and buy-in. And this is a this is a global mission, right? This is not. I don't. I don't think it's going to be physically possible for one country to be able to go to Mars. And I hope that's not the case, right? That we really are thinking of this as a as an Earth, you know, um, integrative <laughs> mission. Um, and so I don't know. I don't know how I would, you know, I couldn't possibly speak to the the global population of what the feeling of that would be. But I think it really does tug at your heartstrings to go. You know, um, there's risk to exploration. There certainly is. Um, and I think it's been in our um, our domain to really do everything we can to keep people as safe and to return them home. And I think that we will never stop caring about making sure that we keep them safe and bring them home. Well said. Well said. Um, Tim, do you have any thoughts on a one-way mission architecture? So I think that NASA has rightfully said that we're going to bring the crew home. That's what NASA does as a government organization. So I think if there's going to be a one-way trip, it's not going to be necessarily a government agency that does that, on one hand. On the other hand, it's still very, very expensive, even for one way. And there are... Um, implications around, um, well, if it's a private mission, what is the governance of that mission? Um, and, you know, Mars has men scientific um, potentials, and we don't want to spoil that. So how do we regulate that? So it just, it opens up all of these questions, and I think we do need to be thinking about them, um, because traditionally, exploration on Earth has been one way more often than not. So we should be thinking about it. But I think, as you point out, um, it's not going to be NASA if it's one way. Yeah, I, I don't think be very popular with the taxpayers. Yes. <laughs> or maybe don't send your favorite astronauts. I don't know. Um, I'm curious, since that got so many upvotes, raise your hand. Which one, how many of you would do a one-way mission to Mars? Raise your hand. Is, there, is anyone, anyone awake? OK, we've got one in, someone in the first row. Anyone in the back row? OK, at least one of you would. Got one brave explorer. Um, okay, so on with the audience questions. Um, this has been a topic for some time. Do you think that the broader industry has grown more receptive to a human-oriented mission? And I, I, I uh, interpret that to mean as opposed to simply um, rover-based missions or robotic missions. Um, any thoughts on that, Tim? I think that we're about to enter a period where we're going to have humans on the moon in a sustained program. And I think that is going to change the world culture and, and their impression of what's possible um, and what's worthwhile um, and see the benefits of, of human exploration into deep space. Um, I don't, that within our community, the space community, yes, of course, for humans to Mars, let's go. Um, but um, I think that that shift hasn't happened in the public yet. Um, and, and I think once th they start to see us being successful, that culture may shift. I think that's a, that's a good point. They start to see us being successful. Where I've noticed the, the temperature changing a bit is um, around the recent Starship launches, because they launch it over and over again. Every time it gets a little bit closer to doing what we want it to do. And that sort of visual progress is very easy for people to track in a way that these more internal um, milestones being made inside NASA aren't visible to people. And it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem because to get more support, you need more funding. To get more funding, you need more support. So other than kind of getting that organic growth, are there any other steps we can take to get more support for a human mission? Anyone? I think you're touching on to, or, and, and whoever asked the question, there's a whole generation. I have three Gen Zers at home, right? And they have always grown up assuming space is just a thing. Um, and it doesn't seem like an unattainable goal for my children and, you know, and their friends as it did when it was my turn and we were sort of thinking like, is this something, something you could even achieve? And so as we try to expand space for all, realistically, and we start to fly more people, I'm really excited to see what this does to inspire the next generation of people to think of space and exploration as another career in which to infuse some energy um, and what can we learn about it and what do we bring back to Earth because of it. So I think right now there needs to be a relational component between why do we send humans. Um, we've been sending robots for a while and I think that folks have an understanding of what that looks like. I think the fact that we anthropomorphized 
the rovers on Mars is, you know, it just, it's just the human tendency and, um, and it really meant so much to so many people. But I think there's an entire generation of kids, multiple generations of kids. Um, I'm excited to see how they look upon sending humans to space as um, a vibrant career path or a vibrant goal um, for them to contribute to. Absolutely. Well, this has been a really nuanced, multi-dimensional session today. So thank, thank you all for that. We've heard about new ways of thinking of systems thinking, um, novel applications of emerging science from gene synthesis um, to nuclear propulsion to AI and big data and um, doing it so more, more inclusively. So don't do it for me without me having all voices at the table. So in the last um, minute here, I'm just going to go quickly down the row. Um, what is your call to action for um, the audience today and how might they get involved? So Elia, any thoughts on the call to action? Oh, um, well, so we have an astronaut biobank now for commercial astronauts. Um, so if you know anyone who's going to space, whether it be through SpaceX or Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic, um, our biobank is open for samples. We look at how the human genome is changing during space flight, and we make it accessible not just to our research community, but to the scientific community writ large. Awesome. I'll have my people call your people. <laughs> um, Jen, any, any calls to action for the audience today? Um, yeah, um, the first one I would say is um, NASA is, among others, um, but specifically NASA has open calls for people to give their thoughts as to what the scientific priorities are going to be on Mars. Um, and if you have thoughts and ideas, um, be on the lookout. Um, the white papers are published. As, as to mention, please read them. Um, if you're interested, please give your opinions, um, because the more opinions that we get, um, the more representative um, that those objectives will be. Perfect. And Tim? My recommendation is to engage your representative and senators in Congress and let them know how important you think humans going to Mars is in the whole Artemis program. Um, and I think that they, they do listen to that type of feedback. And as a community, I think we need to shout that from the hilltop. Wonderful. Well, this has been a wonderful session. Give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs> and we'll see you at the after party.